my book covers actually five regions. For a start, Savoir Bouger and Isère are put together on wine lists often in Paris even, in New York, in everywhere, under the title Savoir, which is wrong. And I mean, it amuses me when I look at a, a good wine list uh, which features some of these wines and I go through them and then I see Franck Peo and I go, oh, hang on a minute, Franck Peo's from the Bouget. And then I see Nicolas Gonin and I go, well, wait a minute, Nicolas Gonin's from Isère. And, and that's why I refuse to call the book Savoir wine. And while I was at it, I thought, well, what about the Alps? And I had one producer saying to me, well, if you're covering the French Alps, you need to go all the way down to Nice. And I went, no, 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 I'm not doing that. I'm not going to do Belay near, near Nice and, and all of that. That's Provence for me. So in the end, I included uh, the Diwa, where Clarette de Dix comes from, and Haute Alp because uh, they are the sort of boundary between uh, the Alps and Provence. They have a little bit of a flavor of both. And there were an also awful lot of crossovers between the two. Um, Clarette Didi, uh, Méthode Ancestrale, and of course another Méthode Ancestrale, Sardon, comes from Bouget. And in the case of Oats Alp, I couldn't resist some of their indigenous grapes, um, notably one that's called Molar. So that's why they're in there. Um, all of these regions share the fact that the vineyards are on the foothills of either, in the case of Bouget and parts of Savoie, the southern Jura, or in the case of the rest, the Prealps. Um, the Prealps being the lower, uh, slightly lower mountains that lead up to the Alps. Uh, it's the same sort of mountain system as you see in South America with the pre-cordillera and then the cordillera of, of the Andes. So limestone di dominates everywhere, but there are incredibly diverse soils because things happen in mountains, things move. And broadly speaking, we're talking of continental climate, not even necessarily a northerly continental climate. This is all in the southern part of France, the southern half of France. Uh, but the mountains influence the weather hugely because of all these different soils, different climates, and for historical reasons as well, because the Alps are crossroads and always have been, there is a huge diversity of great varieties. Um, possibly the most diverse uh, selection of grape varieties in France with the possible exception of the Southwest. Um, and broadly, broad, broad generalization, wines that are fresh and light. Um, this is a putting, putting the regions in context map, um, just so that you can grasp where you are. This is Lac Le Mans, also known as Lake Geneva. Here's Geneva. Jura is up there, Burgundy is over there, the Rhone is here. These are the scattered vineyards of Savoie and over here in this loop that, Bou uh, that the Rhone makes are the scattered vineyards of Bouget. Isère are just these tiny little spots just south of Savoie and those two other regions I mentioned, uh, the Diwa where Claret comes from, Claret de Dix, and the oats out on the same sort of latitude down here, south of Grenoble. So we're sort of closer to the Rhone than anything else. And, and I think the Rhone in terms of wine styles, uh, if you talk of other regions has more influence, certainly more influence than either Burgundy or Jura does. The rivers um, are quite fun to see. I, I do a terrible pun in my book saying, um, all rivers lead to Rhone. Um, the Rhone, of course, rises in Switzerland. So you have the Rhone, uh, the vineyards of the Valley here. Uh, it then sort of washes into Lac Le Mans. It appears here and then flows on down through Cessel, historically very important part of, of, of Savoie, and then does this loop I mentioned before, and then off it goes to Lyon and down through the Rhone. And all of these tributaries, the Isère here comes through the vineyards, the Drome here comes through the vineyards, and so on. There, there's a lot of them. 
and the vineyards needless to say are not quite um, the highest mountains i'm going to do a, a rapid history talk here mainly to see where we are now and why so i mentioned that the alps were a crossroads so obviously there were there's evidence of vineyards pre-romans then of course the romans were important in the alps in the um, whole of the area including the northern rhone they found the peoples called the alabroge there and uh, the Mondeuse grape variety that uh, most of you will have heard of, arguably the most famous red of Savoie, is believed to be um, a sort of modern version of, of what was called by Pliny Vitis Allobrogica. And the description that Pliny actually gave to Vitis Allobrogica was, was that it was a, a late ripening variety that was very hardy and could cope with mountain weather. Um, well, that was one clue, but we, uh, you know, they've done a lot of research into Vitis alabrogica. At some point, it was thought to be Pinot. At some point, Syrah. These days, it's thought to be an antecedent of Mondeuse. So, um, moving rapidly on, caught up the church, and and the church influenced everywhere, as we know, in Western Europe. But in in these mountain areas, it was hugely important because they had places where travelers could rest and the the alps would have been difficult to cross at the best of time until until we had the roads we have now and the railways and so uh, travelers needed resting places and they tended to be the monasteries and the monasteries therefore had to provide them with food and wine and therefore uh, they were often very very high altitude these monastery on on, on what today a principal uh, passes across the Alps. So they did invest in vineyards and as we know the, the church had sort of high principles as to, to how good the wines were. Some of the villages that were mentioned in old writings are the ones where today's best wines come from. Uh, so you know that's history coming forward. Leaping on, the peak like nearly everywhere else was in the 19th century. Um, at that point, uh, wine was produced for the local populations, for people in the mountains that couldn't grow vineyards and so on. And then we had the series of disasters that hit um, everywhere else, but hit the smaller wine regions like Savoie and Bouget and all the rest much harder. Um, so we had phylloxera, mildews, all the diseases, but also uh, the railways arrived. So the railways came bringing... Uh, wine from southern France that was redder, um, deeper red and more alcoholic and cheaper. So what's not to love about that? Then of course the two world wars, uh, even though they did replant with, um, with uh, uh, grafted vines, they never got to the peak of uh, the mid 19th century level and the two world wars basically took away all the young men uh, the older men and the wives got fed up with trying to farm these incredibly steep vineyards and it was the steepness and the difficulty of the work that really nearly meant that, that Savoie and all the other regions died a death. So there were two things that actually helped the recovery uh, from uh, post Second World War. One is very obvious, indicated in this picture, the ski industry. The ski industry arguably saved Savoie in particular, but it wasn't the only thing. The other thing that saved the industry was the arrival of tractors and the arrival of chemicals. And it, it's ironic today because it is organic uh, wines that are driving the renaissance of Savoie wines, but it was chemicals and the, the fact that they made it easier to, um, to weed the vineyards and to deal with disease in this very humid area, they really did save the area and, and the arrival, very late arrival of machinery as well. But the ski industry gave a ready market. So leaping on, by the time we got to the 70s, Savoie, for example, got its Appellation Contrôlée, but um, after that, in theory, they should have gone from strength to strength. And their absolute sort of peak 
event that happened was the 1992 Winter Olympics in Albertville, and they pulled out all the stops to um, make put Savoir wines on the map. Only problem was they had very, very high yields and the wines were crap. So um, they absolutely shot themselves in the foot and uh, really, really was bad news. And there were just a handful of producers like um, Michel Grisard of Domaine Priore Saint Christophe, Domaine du Pasquier, Louis Magnin, just about, he just about set up, just a handful of them. Uh, who were doing better wines. Um, the Jean Perrier family were doing a bit better than the other negociants as they still do. Um, and it was these guys that eventually uh, somehow managed to turn things round with younger generations. And really things have only turned around since uh, in this century when finally they've realized that they must look for quality and look for quality over quantity, lower yields, better understanding and all the rest. So um, quick numbers thing, uh, Savoir specifically equates to just 0.3% of France's total vineyards, the same as the Pinot Noir grown in Santa Barbara County. I did that for a US uh, presentation last year. Um, I thought that was rather wild um, and less than half of Chablis. The two thirds is white, uh, and the sparkling is growing, but is still only 6%. The figures for exports, nobody really knows what they are, so that's why it's a complete guess, but it's pretty likely that although they're growing, they're still under 10%. This is Savoir on its own. Um, this is an extraordinary map, also done by Quentin Sadler, as the other one was, that shows you how downright complicated it all is with all these different crews. It's absolutely madness to have all these different names, and I can't describe them all to you in this short time. The thing to look for here is the islands of vineyards. Um, just looking at Savoie, there are all these different islands, but actually... Um, I, I haven't written this down and it's not in my head, but it's something like 70 or 80 percent comes from this area here. This is the area of Apremont and Abime, and this is the area called the Combe de Savoie, all along the Isère uh, Valley and below the Bauge Mountains, which are here. They are pre-Alps. Um, a rapid run through what matters with the terroir. Uh, for latitude nerds, that famous 45 degrees latitude runs through Savoie. Uh, the altitude isn't nearly as high as you might think. The vast majority of the vineyards are between 250 and 400 meters. There's only a very few that are between 400 and 500 meters. So that's not actually that high. It's only a little bit higher than Alsace in places or even the oak coat, the bone. Uh, the ones that are touching on 500 are in, in isolated places that I might be able to pinpoint later. Uh, the weather is driven from the west. The rain comes from the west, the winds come from the west, but it can be incredibly warm in summer. The proximity of these high mountains, you can see, this is a, a shot I love that, that, like all the pictures, Mick Rock did these. And this is in the middle of the vineyard, somewhere we had a gite when we were researching, when I was researching and I'd invited Mick and Annie to come and stay in this gite. Uh, this is in the middle of the Apremont vineyards. This was just one evening in July. And you can see those are the high mountains there. And in fact, these clouds brought nothing, but the high mountains um, attract the clouds and they're the ones that can bring hailstorms. Something that's happened with climate change is that it looks like we're getting more and more risk of late spring frost and of hail. Um, this year touch wood so far they have been saved um, as everywhere in eastern France because not only was the spring early and warm it can mean that there's a disaster looming um, but so far there hasn't been a cold snap uh, there's been a few risky days recently but I think we're all right at the moment but there have been far too many years recently with very very severe spring frosts and some really disastrous hailstorms usually later in the season so um 
Apremont, for example, in, uh, oh, was it last year? Yeah, it was last year in 2019, had the most appalling hailstorm that came up through the Rhone. I think it hit uh, Cornas in the Rhone. Then it came up to Savoy, then it went on to Switzerland. It actually hailed in the Apremont vineyards in one part of them for 20 minutes. Now, normally hailstorms are just five minutes uh, at most, and the actual stones were much bigger than normal. So it really, really did wreck. Originally, they thought 250, 300 hectare. It was actually 100 hectare odd that copped it badly, but that's still a large amount in a very, very tiny region. <clears throat> Day-night temperature variations obviously increase with altitude. Um, they're not nearly as significant as somewhere like Argentina, but uh, you'll see that on the usual um, winery tech seats and all the rest to promote the wines. Um, the main thing is that, that wines are driven by acidity and that acidity, um, uh, the, the nights are usually cold enough for that acidity to be retained. The steep slopes give very, very varied exposures. Um, I'm gonna rush through this, but this is just a little diagram that's in my book. Um, which shows you the variations of soil and the fact that the Bauge, the Chartreuse and the Bell, uh, no, sorry, the Bauge and the Chartreuse are pre-Alp, whereas the Bell Don are actually higher Alps, the real Alps. And these pre-Alps, their peaks are about 2000 meters. You can see there the Don d'Acruza, for example, other peaks, they all just before 2000 meters, including the famous Mont Granier, which I'm going to show you a picture of in a minute. Um, Mont Granier uh, fell off, basically. There was the most um, awful land, um, rockfall and landslide in 1248, which actually changed this terroir that you can see here and gave a form of limestone scree that's very modern over a much more ancient soil. But even these areas here, their soils were actually created when the glaciers melted. The glaciers, now rivers, moved all the different soils along. Alluvial co cones, which are considered very fertile, but not too fertile for, for vines, are, are really quite important. So the main thing is to know that there is an awful lot of diversity, which is why you can have such a diversity of grapes. Um, this is Mont Granier, very, very distinctive. Uh, this is the largest rock that is still there that actually fell off in 1248. Um, it it, it basically this landslide that came from the rockfall happened in November after huge amounts of rain and it um, buried all the villages in its path. So older texts say that 5,000 people and all the livestock lost their life. Modern texts say that that's impossible and that it was more like a thousand people, but there were more people living up here than there were in the Chambéry, in the city of Chambéry and its area, because this was a place they could farm and they were above what were the marshes of the Isère River before the Isère River was dammed. And that's where they could farm. Obviously, they were all a goner and they did not bring uh, any farming or settlements back for several hundred years, they then realized that actually the one thing that could grow in this rubble were vines. And although they tried growing red because that's what everybody wanted to drink, they wouldn't ripen properly. And it was the ubiquitous in Savoir, the Jacquer variety, that they found would ripen in these stony slopes and would ripen in what were very varied aspects, um, some of them even facing north. Um, so steep slopes you see uh, obviously a lot here and the best vineyards are generally on steep slopes. By the time the Second World War had come, most of the steep slopes had been overtaken by this sort of forest that you see here. So this vineyard that you're looking at here, which is uh, in Chignan, uh, 
is is typical of a vineyard that has been replanted in the last 10 15 years on these steep slopes it's been replanted using um the training called uh sur echelard on a single stake a little bit like um the northern rhone but you don't usually see the sort of wigwam effect it's very very labor intensive this is a vineyard that's run organically uh at, but uh, the the cost of the labor and the time it takes is 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 very very significant uh, lots of manual work on slopes like this, uh, weed control being the difficult thing because of, of the high humidity and fungal disease you have to keep on top of as well. So it's all very, very challenging. And so they are desperate to get more money for their wine, not surprisingly. And the organic vineyards, um, the organic producers do charge more and are beginning to get more for their vines. So. Um, a quick run through all these um, um, indigenous varieties. I can't tell you all about them, but Jacquer is the most planted, although it used to be 50% of the Savoie vineyards. It's now 42%. And not a lot of new plantings go on, but it's beginning to be valued more. It's used in sparkling wines as well as still, but there are some people realizing that even Jacquer should be aged for a little bit longer when it's made properly. Uh, but it does give this gorgeous freshness and low alcohol. Um, having said that, the, um, in 2018, they were actually coming up uh, with, sorry, 2019, last year, they were actually coming up with natural percentages of 12%, which was sort of unheard of for Jacquer. Normally it will end up at nine or 10 and be chapterized up to 10 and a half, something like that, or up to 11 or 11 and a half. And so things have been changing very dramatically. The most exciting variety for me is Altesse, which makes the wines that are called Roussette de Savoie, also grown a little bit in Bouget, where it makes the Appellation Roussette du Bouget. Altesse um, has a, a whole load of different mystical and mythical stories attached to it, but actually, um, it's believed now to be indigenous to the Lac Le Mans and Savoie area and very distantly related maybe to Chasselas, but we're not sure. Uh, Roussan is called Bergeron in Savoie and is only allowed to be grown in Chignan. Came up from the Rhone and there was very little of it planted um, until recently. It doesn't have a very great history there. Chardonnay really is an incomer here, whereas uh, in Jura, those of you that have heard me speak on Jura, I do d defend its history in Jura because uh, it goes back a long way there, but there's no real place for it in Savoie. Chasselas has grown in the north of the area near La Le Mans, no surprise, near the Swiss border. Grange, um, I've put Grange on here because if you talk to Americans who know about Savoie, they will presume that Grange is uh, one of the most important grape varieties there. Why will they do this? Because Grange makes the wine called Aize, spelt A-Y-Z-E, uh, still and sparkling. There is one producer there who um, has become the arguably most cult producer of Savoie around the world, Domaine Bellois, um, Dominique Bellois. And he didn't look for his fame, it just came to him. It was importers. And Aïs is made from Grange, but that's the only place it's grown. It's a grape variety, also indigenous to the area, um, believed to be uh, related to another rare grape called Molette. So there are tons and tons of grapes in the French Alps that are unusual and rare. Molette is good for sparkling wine. Mondeuse Blanche is not a um, variation of Mondeuse Noir. It is actually a separate variety and just happens to be distinguished by being the mother of Syrah. Uh, Verdes is, is a really um, exciting and unusual grape in mainly in Isère and just over the border in Savoie. 
clarets also grown in Languedoc, but is important in Diawano itself. And then there are these very, very rare grape varieties, and there's a ton of them being rehabilitated at the moment. Why? Because uh, many people believe that, that these grape varieties will be better equipped to cope with climate change. They were dropped in the past because they didn't produce quantity, they didn't ripen reliably, but now with our better understanding of, of farming, uh, in particular, and with climate change, uh, these grapes need to be rescued and rehabilitated. With reds, um, believe it or not, the most planted is Gamay. I'm finding it quite hard to find the real history of Gamay and Savoir. I don't think it goes back for a long, long time, but uh, there was much more of it planted than there is now. It's not being replanted, but there are some decent, very pleasant gamets around, not least because most of it was planted in the 60s and 70s, so therefore you're getting old vines now. The great um, quality standard bearer is Mondeuse, um, a distant, well, not that distant relative of Syrah. It's still being argued about as to what exactly the relationship between Londres Noir and Syrah is. It may be a grandchild, it may be a grandparent. Um, they, the ampelographers keep, up, come, keep on coming with, with new theories. It has been gradually planted more and more and more. And if it says anything they're planting now, it's Mondeuse for reds and Altes for whites. Pinot Noir has been here a while. Uh, it's used for sparkling and a little bit of um, not usually very distinguished reds with a few exceptions. And the talk of the town is Persan. There's only a tiny amount of Persan, but along with Mondeuse, it was always in the 19th century writings considered to be the finest red grape. Uh, it gives a higher alcohol than Mondeuse. Mondeuse naturally rarely produces more than 11% whereas naturally Persan can hit the heights of 12 or more. It was dropped because it was difficult for disease, um, but it, and it nearly, nearly, nearly died out. So uh, there were literally a couple of hectares left and it was rescued. And today there is somewhere between 20 and 25 hectares. Uh, a little bit is planted each year in Savoie and in neighbouring Isère, where it has a long history as well. Um, some of the rare ones related to Persan, I've got a real growing soft spot for Etre de la Duie, spelt in many different ways. Um, there's only a tiny amount of it, but I love it. Uh, Douce Noir, just for the anecdote, is nothing other than Bonada in Argentina. Uh, but nearly died out in Savoie, is not allowed in the Appellation Contrôlée, actually fell out of the French grape register, which meant that you weren't even allowed to plant it to make commercial wine. That has been rehabilitated by the wonderful Centre Ampelographique Alpine, uh, named after the late Pierre Gallet, um, the ampelographer who died at New Year, age 98. Um, another grape I'm very fond of is Mola from the Oats Alp, only a tiny bit of that around. And then there are these extraordinary, very rare ones that are being rescued and rehabilitated. So it's all very exciting. This to me is the, the USP that the Alps have. And I think the wines that they're producing can be very extraordinary. I've gone way over time. So look, look all of this up. But um, it's Savoir van de Savoir, they're the same thing. Um, but there are all these different crews and so on. Cremant is fairly recent coming in. There are various different variations because of these different great requirements. Most of the best ones, in my view, have got some Pinot and Chardonnay blended in with the Jacquard. Uh, Roussette de Savoie Altesse, there are some extraordinary ones from um, Maritel and also Frangie, the other two um, crews are tiny. Cessel is a sad story, but Royal Cessel, uh, the brand, is, has been rescued and is still is pretty decent these days. And IGP Van des Alabroges is the Van de Pay, the, the IGP. There is one very, very famous producer there, um, Domaine des Ardoisières, producing some excellent wines from a 
rehabilitated, um, replanted vineyard outside the Appalachian area. And this is why you don't want me to go into all of these crews because this is where they all are. I've highlighted some of the ones that are, are most widely available. Um, IES, I mentioned already, Apremont, the, the biggest in terms of quantity. There are some good ones. Cruet, uh, those of you who know Yap will know that Domaine de Lidil produce Cruet. Uh, Chignan, um, everybody named Kenar is not the same. There are, I think, eight different domains named Kenar. So make sure you get your right domain Kenar and the first name, get the first name right. Um, there, the basic white, if you see nothing on a label, will be Jacquer unless it's right up here in Haute Savoie, in which case it'll be Chasselas. Oh, it's madness. Chignan Bergeron's got to be Roussan. Arbin is the most famous Mondeurs, but I love the ones from Saint-Jean-de-la-Porte and elsewhere as well. Uh, Bouget, we haven't got time for. Saudon, amazing pink ancestral bubbly. Roussette de Bouget, um, uh, you will see around from Franck Peyo in the UK and um, there are various up and coming but look how tiny there are only tiny amounts of Altes and Mondos because in the 70s and 80s they had a um, uh, an advisor who wanted to basically keep the growers going with something that they could plant successfully ripen and sell and that's why um, Chardonnay uh, was the most planted variety. Gamay is mostly for Saudon, but that's why there's so little of Altes and Mondeurs. And one of the facts I don't have up here that I should is that there's about 450 hectares total. So um, this is a lovely picture that Mick took of the Domaine des Ardoisières with its donkeys um, that just happened to be posing for us that was rather lovely. You know you can buy my book and I will turn this off and um, please do buy that on any form or contact me uh, if you want to review it and you never know, I might let you. Um, I'm going to see whether I can stop the share. Um, hi guys. And shall I, what are we doing about questions, Andrea? Right, okay. Well, thank you, Wink. Um, first of all, obviously we've, you could obviously continue to tell us more, and I think you've provided an excellent yes. platform, Wink, um, for the wines of Savoir and the French Alps, and uh, maybe we'll have to have a follow-up another time. It but is from Savoir. Anybody who has any questions now would uh, perhaps best to type them through. If I keep people on a mute at the moment, um, and then when a question comes through, um, I can uh, unmute you and you can um, ask Wink your question. Um, does anybody have any questions? I haven't got anything that's come through to me. Um, <laughs> Jeff Kingsley. Too much. Jeff Quing Kingsley has a question. Go ahead, Jeff. Oh. Jeff? Oh. Yeah, I, I, I typed it in the chat. But, um, but it, I just want, I, I spend a lot of time in the region and I tend to drink these wines uh, pretty much the year after they're bottled. Do any of these cepages age, uh, age well or are they mainly for, for immediate drinking? Um, this is a, an excellent question. If, if you didn't hear it, because it, it was a bit faint, it's about whether any of the, 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 in the region you find that most of the wines are bottled within uh, a year of harvest. And the question was, do they age? Um, this is a battle that I and, and several other people are having um, with vignerons all over the region. Uh, almost all of them do age very well, especially from the Altesse grape, from the Roussan grape, i.e. Bergeron. Um, those two for whites, but some of the Jacquer age too. And with reds, both Mondeurs and Persan can age really well for several years. Um, and if they are handled right with the usual thing of low yields and, um, and but not too low and uh, the right sort of aging and so on, uh, the Altes, for example, will age 15, 20 years, no problem. And I've had Mondeurs of that age as well. The, thing, the thought is that Persan will age as well, but because we've only had commercial ones for a few years, um, the, that is a wait and see thing. But I have already had um, 
from Domaine Saint-Germain, I've had Persson of about eight to 10 years old that has been excellent in fine fettle. They've got everything to make them age. So why don't they do it? For the simple reason that they still sell huge amounts to the ski resorts um, and for tourism. And the whole idea in the past was to get the latest vintage there in time for the ski season. That meant bottling in December after the vintage. <laughs> and if, if not then, for certain, they would do that for, and still do for Jacquère and Gamay. And then for Altesse and Mondeuse, they would bottle in January to be able to deliver it in time for the peak ski season, which is in, in mid-February. So this has been a horror, really, and uh, the local technologists advised them what to do. So in the early days when I used to um, taste and drink Mondeuse, it was really just like a sort of spicier, slightly more rustic form of Gamay because it was made with semi-carbonic maceration um, and just, well, no, in fact, it wasn't even made with semi-carbonic. It was just made with a very, very short times on the skins and just bottled early. And that's a disaster. They, they need to wait for bottling until May or June at least. And um, the ones that do, uh, notably the younger generation and the up and coming organic uh, producers are doing a great job. Um, Jeff, that was a really good question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I think the next one is from Liz. Liz Saggies. Liz. Hello, Wink. Hello. Uh, what are the export prospects now for wines of the French Alps, um, especially into the UK? And are they rising as a result of your book? Because it is giving them a lot of publicity. <laughs> uh, let's deal with the last part of the question first. Um, individual producers are grateful for my book. Uh, the region hasn't got its act together as a whole. The, um, I, I had the same issue with, with Jura, really. It took about three years for them to go, oh, yeah, you've written a book. Yes, that could be useful for us, you know. Um, and the same's happening in Savoie. The thing is, it's in English and it's not in French. And they don't see this as an advantage. They see that it's a disadvantage because they mainly sell to France. Oh, don't get me started. Um, so, <laughs> so what are the export prospects? The organic, the young organic up and coming producers are arguably, some of them doing things quite dangerously, quite riskily. They are refusing to sell to the ski resorts and they are focusing almost exclusively on exports and perhaps selling to a few top restaurants in the area and aiming at Paris and Lyon and flatly refusing to sell to the ski resorts. Um, it's a risky, risky sort of um, approach to take, but um, as far as them coming to England, there, there's really quite a huge, uh, quite a wide range around uh, Vine Trail bring in an excellent selection. Carve de Peren have a few. Uh, and there, there are more and more out there. The thing is that quantity-wise, with the exception of Jacquère, um, so Apremont and so on, they're not ideal for supermarkets and multiples and so on. And price-wise, that's a problem as well. So therefore, the niche is there for the more expensive, in particular organic, but not exclusively organic wines. There are some non-organic ones coming in too. Um, there are no statistics on exports as to what is going where, um, but there's definite growing interest in other countries, uh, partly going on the shirt tails of Jura, in the US, in, Scan in various countries in Scandinavia, in Japan, um, and so I can see that the UK may follow on behind that a bit as well. Thank you. Okay, any more? Uh, yes, Christos. And then Maggie. Uh, Hi, Christos. A lot of us buy from the Wine Society. They've got three 
uh, whites, I don't know if you, you're aware of those in their current list. Um, do you know them? Have you tasted them? Are they good examples if we wanted to use them in a tasting? Um, I can't I can't see your list, but I do know oh, exactly the range from the Wine Society. They've taken on some wines from um, Jean-Francois Kenna, I think. Yes, um, two, two, two of those are the three of the whites. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Chignan so... Again, and the Chignan Bergeron or Pied de Tour. Yeah, they're excellent. Um, in in terms of in terms of um, doing tastings for the for those among you who are educators, um, it's not surprising that I've been doing quite a lot of tastings. In fact, um, I'm supposed to be in the UK. Well, in fact, I'm supposed to be in where am I supposed to be? I'm supposed to be in Sweden right now, um, but I was supposed to be in the UK before, and I had um, four tutored tastings in my diary and the wines are sitting in my garage in the UK and I hope um, are okay there because I bought them all. So I bought some of them from the Wine Society and including um, one J.F. Kinnar wine. Though he's, a, he's a, one of the excellent producers there. Um, not organic but beginning conversion to organics and an extremely good winemaker. Um, I also bought some wines from Vinatis um, Vinatis are a company that I should know more about than I do. They're actually based down the road to, from where I am now. And I didn't realize that until I went on to Wine Searcher to have a look at what wines were available in the UK. And Vinatis are a French company who ship to the UK, or at least they do at the moment. Whether they'll be able to after the 31st of December is another matter. Um, but um, they definitely do it at the moment. And I found their deliveries have been superb. And they have a big range of decent Savoir wines. So that's somewhere to get more from. Then there's Yap, who, who do Domaine de Lidl, who are okay, not as good as they were in a way, um, and, um, and the other people that I mentioned already. I think that the Wine Society might like to do a few more. The, the other one that they do that I buy a lot of, that they buy, that Vine Trail import, but um, the Wine Society deal with them too, um, is the Al Roussette du Bouget um, Altesse from Franck Peo. And, and that is really good value. And also his sparkling wine from the Cru Montagneur is, is one of the finest sparkling, metro traditionnel sparkling wines in the Alps. I would highly recommend it. It's made from a blend of uh, Chardonnay with Altesse and Mondeuse, actually, in the blend. It's very yeah, that's the list. Great, thanks, Wink. That's very helpful. Wonderful. Okay. And I think we've got one last question from Maggie, who has, is unmuted, I see. Hi, Maggie. Hi. Hi, Wink. Hi, Maggie. Um, I'm curious to know to what extent the move to resurrect the older cepage um, in order to hedge against climate change is meeting with any, I don't know, tension to promote the region as a more internationally friendly region where they grow grapes and make wine from varieties that are more well known. Well, that's a difficult and complicated question. Um, uh, there are several leading lights, uh, producers who are considered leading lights, who are, are very involved in, um, in working with indigenous and local and rare varieties. So uh, Nicola Gonard, who is based in um, a rather remote part of Isère, for example, is um, one of the vice presidents of the Centre Ampelagraphique Alpine that I mentioned earlier. His wines are exported to the U.S. Um, uh, he's, a, he's a sort of standard, he, he, he waves the flag for Isère, but he waves the flag for the grapes as well. And he has some up and coming wines from uh, experiments. That, I mean, there's one, for example, that he made 90 bottles because he made it in a demijohn. You know, we're talking of that sort of thing. But he will, is one of the people to get Persson known. The Isère in particular is doing, it's tiny, but there's him and there's another producer who unfortunately the two don't get on. 
oh, they're in two different parts of his air. Uh, but the other one is Thomas Fino, um, who uh, produces uh, Verdes as well, which is a rare white variety, as well as Persan and Etre de la Duy, which I mentioned earlier. And he has a neighbor who he does get on with, Domaine des Routissons, who will be exporting soon. Over the border in Savoie, um, it, I, it's just a very, very slow process because there are two things that are slow. A, rehabilitating rare grapes is a very slow process and I've got an article that I keep meaning to write but I'm sure nobody will pay me for it but you never know. I keep meaning to sit down and write this article about how you rehabilitate a grape um, from based on, on seminars I've been to at the Centre Ampelographique's annual meeting. And uh, I might do it for circle, for the circular, you never know. I, I keep, it's on my list that I keep meaning to do in this uh, lockdown period instead of being in Sweden. Um, and so that process is a very, very long process. But the other thing is about the authorities. So one of the wonderful things that has happened is that the AOC in Savoie is about to be changed to allow a little, a few more of these rarer grape varieties. And that will encourage more of the traditional producers to plant them. But at the moment, the rules are you are not allowed more than 10% of your vineyards planted with, with what are considered accessory varieties. Um, and that limits the expansion. Uh, and I know a couple of producers who cheat, who obviously will be nameless because I don't want to put, get them into trouble. Um, but it, it's ridiculous. So the main varieties have to be 90% of the vineyard. So it's a very complicated thing. But Maggie, um, thanks for that question. Mm -hmm. Does that answer a sort of? Yes, sort of? yes, yeah. thank you. Okay. Okay, I think that's exhausted the questions for now, Wink, and uh, okay. I think we've taken up enough of your time. Thank you very much indeed. Yes. It's lunch time. Uh, let me just unmute everybody, otherwise um, we won't be able to have people. Oh, Anybody else drinking wine or is it just me? <laughs> Hang on, I'll just unmute everybody. There we are, everybody's unmuted. Have, Thank have, you, you, seen, has, has, have you all seen that wonderful, there are so many videos around at the moment, but there's a wonderful couple of versions of videos about zoom conferences so if you haven't seen this just look for them that show and these are not they've not been started by the wine trade although i wish we had started them they show somebody with a cup of tea like um vivian has got but they show how you prepare your cup of tea and you 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 know the tea bags with the little um with the little um tag on the end so you get one of the tags and you cut it off and you you glue it you you stick it with sellotape to your mug so that you're having your business zoom conference and they can see that you've got your mug with your tea bag hanging over but in fact inside your <laughs> mug is there's a prosecco one and there's a red wine one and so on and that. Yes. so that you're having so this is for non-wine trade people who but i cannot believe i'm the only one drinking i am verging on being embarrassed it's an hour later where you are it's an hour later where you are that's true that is my justification <laughs> Okay, well, lovely to see you all. I hope that helped a little bit um, with, uh, it, it's complicated. That's why I had to write 384 pages. So um, <laughs> it is now available on EPUB on, direct from my website, if you want. A and on, on Kindle Wink? It's on, Kindle? Uh, it's on Kindle too. <laughs> as of last week so i hate yeah, i thought so because when i bought the other one it wasn't there yeah no i it got uploaded last week i think it was i and it's one of the things i've done in lockdown um and yeah but uh it's on epub too she says and epub you can buy uh, although i don't think itunes have uploaded it yet um i'm gonna have a quick look at the chat before that you before you turn it off andrea because i haven't been looking at the chat 
um, shoot me over the presentation. No, it's um, it'll cost you money, Robert. Sorry, <laughs> it's, it's a private message, but there you go. Um, and um, oh my goodness, that was the question that I think I've answered, Maggie. That's good. Other other questions I've answered. Yeah, they all um, brilliant, them. brilliant, brilliant. Um, which Appalachian village is my house? Uh, I am in the ski resort of Grand Bonan. My nearest Appalachian village is Aïs, where Dominique Bellois is. It would take me about 45 minutes to drive to him. And it takes me an hour and quarter to drive to the main part of the vineyards near Chambéry. And by the way, for those people that like to commission me to write on Jura, it takes me nearly three hours to drive there. Just so you know, <laughs> up on a mountain. <laughs> Thank you very much again, Wink. Fabulous, Wink. Thank, Thank you so much. Have a good weekend, yeah. all. Lovely to see you all.